Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hi, and welcome back to Journey Forward with Jory Rose. I am really looking forward to the conversation today with Angelina Lombardo. Hello, my dear. Hello, hello, hello. We have been waiting for a long time for this conversation. And what I love about you is our paths keep crossing in a variety of places. Like we just kind of keep popping up for each other. So I think the universe was meant for us to be connected in a variety of ways. I am so happy to have you on today and you have so many awesome things to share because at the very least you have new books coming out, but I just, I want to hear all of your awesomeness that you can share with our listeners. So go ahead and just introduce (laughs) who you are and um, what your journey has been. Oh, wow. Big question, but you know, I, not really. <laughs> right. Yes and no, right? It's a right. big question. Sometimes it could be loaded. Um, I'll make it. So I will start with this. My name, of course, you already said is Angelina. And I am a, um, I'm a mother of one and a mentor to many, mm. I like to say. Um, currently, I am about to launch my audio book called Love Letters to a Stripper, and that's happening tomorrow. So I'm really excited. Wow. Huge, huge congratulations on that. You will tell us more about that for sure and how people can find that audio book. Yes. I can't wait to hear more about that. Yes. Yes. I would love to share a link so they can join. Um, And then I just wrote a new book. Uh, so you're like a busy mama, my dear. I'm definitely a busy mama. I'm definitely, um, I am looking to reach bigger mass of people with my love so that this is my work. That's exactly what I'm doing. So, and when you reach those bigger mass of people, what do you want them to know about you or know about themselves from whatever you're offering? Ah, <sighs> so Number one, I would say choosing love, Mm. really a good place to start in anything, whether it's your mind, you're thinking things, whether it's your body, you're feeling things, whether it's your soul, spirit expressing itself, it's love. Love is pretty much, you can apply that to pretty much any aspect that you're experiencing as a human, right? Absolutely. So I want that to be the first, I think, uh, universal law. Choosing love is really all, is the answer first and foremost. And the next thing I would say uh, is that you're the expert on yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm a relationship and trauma expert. And when it comes to part of my journey, really a lot, a huge part of my journey was coming from not being wrong. I thought there was something wrong with me. Oh yeah. Right. And so as I, isn't that something, so it's hard to interrupt, but I think we all have felt that at least some point in our life, whether, you know, younger or current age. Yeah. Yeah, Something about the way you said that just really struck me. I had to just to stop you there for a moment and just sit with that. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting with that is a really good way, way to drop in and actually feel what that's like when you feel inherently like there, there is something inherently wrong with Mm. you as a being. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a huge part. That's a huge part in suffering for my, from my experience. Um, I had from my childhood, I've, I've had a lot of, um, Let's see. So my childhood has brought me to what I'm speaking about today. I suffered greatly Mm. as a young person and thought that because I knew nothing more from birth until I was on the streets, homeless, 14. I knew nothing but trauma. Yeah. Wow. So I hadn't seen reality. Uh, in any way, but through the lens of dysfunction and abuse. Mm. And so 
t taking that experience of actually being a true victim and moving it forward, there was uh, there was a great deal of of there was a great deal of work to be done on yeah. every level, body, mind, and soul, spirit. And so uh, when I say that there is nothing wrong, I actually felt that there was something wrong with me inherently because it kept cycling. I kept perpetuating unconsciously mm -hmm. the cycle of that generational victimhoods. You know, there are those cycles. Well, that transgenerational trauma is yeah. it's embedded in your DNA. That's exactly what I'm, I'm speaking to exactly that. So it was embedded there in my DNA. Then it was also shown to me through that lens physically in action, right? Then mm -hmm. I go out into the world lacking resources, really a victim of the world. Thinking that Thinking. probably was that baseline was probably, you thought it was normal. That's it was that it was normal that it hurt mm -hmm. um, and that it there was something wrong with me because it kept happening to me it yeah. kept I saw that through the lens of it's yeah. happening to me and that changed that changed all in a catalyst in a catalytic moment I would say yeah. where the first time and it came through more trauma I attempted suicide and uh, was successful I died I've had um, two death experiences wow. and a coma. So, and a coma. And a coma. So there was a period of time where, you know, my young, my young self couldn't take anymore. And, and yet your spirit clearly was meant to continue on because you are here and alive and well and beautiful and thriving. <laughs> so, you know, that's true. The universe did have a different plan for you. And that's what I'm speaking to. Exactly. I so, keep reading your mind. We are so connected right now. <laughs> universal synchronicity. This is just I not love it. a coincidence. We no, have been meant to line up. So, yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm speaking to. I had a complete spiritual experience during those during that time. And I just realized by the end in the coma that I was, you know, journeying and uh, yeah, I'm not supposed to leave the planet. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I definitely know more than I knew before and that this wasn't all that there was, like yeah. this happening to me, this victimization of su just this suffering, suffering, suffering. How so old thank were you during the, the coma? At what point in your life was so that? So the, the coma, that was the very last bit, and I was um, – Six, about 16, 15, 16 in between. Okay. It started, I think, at the end of my 14th year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's when I um, first took, it's my first uh, suicide attempt. Okay. The second suicide attempt um, was shortly after, I would mm -hmm. say probably by months. Okay. And then that last one was pretty interesting because I still have uh, amnesia about myself actually taking pills. Mm -hmm. that inevitably ended me up dead, dead, dead for quite a while. And then into that, in that coma. And to this How day, did you get healed from the undead part. The yeah. undead, very interesting stuff. You know, here's part of the dying and death experience and spirit experience. So I definitely, um, took those pills. This is, this is a little bit of facts. I took some pills the night before I was supposed to wake up and go to school. I was living with friends and I shared a bed with my girlfriend and, um, she woke up and I wouldn't wake up. So mm -hmm. in, in this place, I wasn't, I, I think I was probably very sleeping, I'm very much sleeping, but the day progressed and I was dying slowly. My heart rate was slowing down further, wow. etc. By the time she had gotten home, and she had alerted her mom, listen, she's in the same position that she was in when I left. There's something wrong. She yeah. came into the room, and that's when I remember that I wasn't in my body. And then paramedics were called. I was watching this resuscitation happen. I was watching You were them. observing the process. I was observing the process 100% outside of my body, close to my body, though. So I that entire mm -hmm. thing probably took about 25 minutes. I remember waking up, but not waking up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's when, um, they had brought me back. They had resuscitated my, you know, my heart, wow. uh, had started beating again. They got a pulse. And then that was my journey into just staying asleep in a deep, deep sleep wow. and journeying, doing that journey.
then. So, um, yeah, it was, it informed, it has informed a lot for me. And so in what areas? So I would say it's deep in my spiritual and I spiritual and soul are the same to me, right? Mm -hmm. My wise spiritual right. soul knowledge, like that's a, it's like a, it operates like a brain for me. Sure. It's not, so it's, it's, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, I think you understand what I'm trying to say here yeah. is that it operates it as a selfhood. Yes. Yeah, so no, I, I definitely can feel that. Yeah. I deepened that. It also opened up my, um, my, oof. it opened up the way I saw things. So it gave me a macro versus mm -hmm. a micro. When you're suffering, so much is internalized and it's very micro. You're, it's, it's, it just has this vibration, this heavy vibration. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I was not just the body, knowing that this was not just the only dimension that was available to us as right. a human, knowing that bigger view gave my, uh, my human experience mind more of a an expansive view. I was going to say, it sounds like it broadened your view. Yeah. It broadened the view. So when something would happen, there was, uh, you know, there was something that I could take. I could take, I, I, you know, at 16 years old, when I woke up from that coma, it didn't automate. My generational victimhood cycles hadn't imagined, like, they hadn't disappeared. I still yeah. had a huge journey to, you know, complete with of course. this bit of information, but that bit of information was the catalyst. And it allowed for me to look at things through a different lens. And were you able to start seeing it outside of just that victimhood role or victimhood yeah. experience? So maybe ask well, that question a little, yeah, a little bit more. If you, yeah. I mean that, that expansiveness where you, and when you say you were able to start to feel that this wasn't the only viewpoint. Mm. How did you start to integrate that? I mean, because there's a huge amount of, yeah. I mean, that's like, I mean, it's a silly question on one level because it's a lifetime's journey to do that. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, what, one of the things I love about mindfulness and its roots in Buddhist practice is the knowledge that suffering exists. Yes. Pain is inevitable. And, you know, what I like to teach and what I like to really believe is well, there are bigger atrocities than others, don't get me wrong, but suffering is so universal that it's so personal, we can't compare the suffering. Now, yes, when I think of suff like true suffering, I think of the Holocaust victims. And so yeah. my bad day could never compare to someone in the Holocaust. But if that's my only definition of suffering, then I'll never honor my bad day. Right. That's absolutely true. And so in that sense, I really like to believe that there is no hierarchy to suffering because if it's your suffering, it's real. It's yours. It could be no one's 10 or even a five on that scale has to look the same. Exactly. For it to be your real true experience. Exactly. And I don't know where I was really going with that, but it just made me think about as you were saying that, I mean, what you were experiencing was really deep level of suffering. And while not everyone has had a, a situation of being suicidal or being in a coma as a result, people have felt, yes. I'm not worthy of being here. I don't know how to live through my pain. You know, this transgenerational trauma is going to take over. It's the truth of all. It's the only truth. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of, when you ask the question, what do I hope to bring to the mass of people that, uh, the mass of body pe of people that I, I hope to inspire, right? right? And it is exactly this, is that I had started saying, you're the expert on you. Meaning, uh, you know, your 10 is your 10 and someone else's five is your 10. We cannot know. So no one can tell me that, what I'm experiencing isn't actually what I'm experiencing. Right. And I own that, which actually I create. In that case, I create. I'm mm -hmm. the creator, which gives me, okay, control, which it's the illusion of control, of course. Right. A hundred percent. But then if I'm owning that and I am the creator and there is a certain 
control that is eluded to this. Right. Then it allows like one part of your being, I would probably say your cognitive mind to step aside and let your wise heart or that wise soul sort of take over, which that is really the truth. And it rides with everything in this Buddhist practices is that is exactly the, it was the next catalyst moment for me, which Mm. was the book of the living and the dead. So I am very, um, I relate I related very much to that. Yeah. Um, that actually that helped me. It it informed me and educated me about suffering. Right. I thought I was the only one. You know, I I really believed as a young person that it's just my family. It's just us. You know, we're taught to keep the secrets. Right. Everyone else's life looks so much better. They look like they function. They're loving. They've got lights on. They're not poor. They're you know just it's everybody else is better but we are not. And it's only happening to me. But when I came to the realization that it's actually suffering and everyone is suffering, it felt so liberating. It was very liberating. And it's one of the things that, you know, Kristen Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion, one of the three definitions of self-compassion is she says, based on her research, is the idea of common humanity. Yes. And the idea that the way that I interpret that common humanity piece is I am unique, but my problems are not. Oh yeah. Right. We're not that simple. I mean like we're special, but no, not really. Not really. And it's when we think we're so unique in our problems that we then isolate ourselves Yes. because we think, Oh, no one's going to understand me. And so we stay really silent and we don't have the vulnerability to share our suffering. And then, ooh, what happens when we do? Oh, my God, we're now connected to others. I, I just came back from leading one of my women's retreats at Marivelle in Austin, actually, last night. And we did an exercise in practicing communication skills. But what it really was was a practice in being present and being mm. passionate and sitting with another person. And it's so amazing when we peel back the shield of perceived judgments or needing to have that facade, how we can just show up as humans. Yeah. Yep. And how deep the connection goes. I mean, it's also Brene Brown's work, right? That vulnerability breeds connection. And when we have the safety, you know, to be able to steep into that place, we just have an amazing ability to say, oh my God, you too? Or you know, wait, I'm not the only one who has felt alone or unworthy or scared or insecure, regardless of the details. The details will change, but the the emotions behind a lot of the traumas. And I also love, I mean, you said you, um, in one of the things you said about yourself, a relationship and, and working with trauma. And so how do you define a trauma? Ooh, a trauma. This is very, thank you for asking me that question. I love that question because uh, there's a few things. One, we're getting very much more clear about trauma as a whole, um, as far as society is concerned, especially Mm -hmm. because Brene Brown, thank you, Brene. We, I absolutely love her. I do too. Um, She's just, it's just really, her work is super crucial. The, the thing that she has opened up just gives a voice to so much and so many. So I define trauma as any experience of the, by the experiencer. So any experience you experience that act, that actually you feel on a somatic level, Mm -hmm. which a lot of people may or may not um, experience at the moment of trauma. And then in, in return, that trauma is now in your body and it's unexpressed. Yeah. So, I, and, and we, I, I, I was just gonna say, I had a conversation with um, a woman, Faith Harper, and she was on the podcast a couple episodes ago mm-hmm. and she defined, you know, anything that dysregulates the nervous system. That's exactly what it leads to. So if it's unexpressed, so we are definitely geared to survive, right? Yes. The trauma. So we our our um, our amygdala steps into the into the space, and it it fight, flight, freeze, 
there is some way our nervous system is in a split second for survival, we will step in. The but alarm starts flaring off. <laughs> alarm, that's right. The alarm goes and you're either running or you are freezing to serve. Right. Whatever that calls to do, whatever the situation calls to for your right. to do, it will respond that way. It's, it's designed to survive. However, it also dysregulates the nervous system yeah. when it's not acknowledged and embraced and lived through. That doesn't mean at all that you're, you know, after you're trauma traumatized, you sit, you know, you, you go immediately to, you definitely want support immediately, of right. course, depending on that trauma. But what I'm really getting at is, is trauma is actually more defined by the experience, the experiencer, the person versus what we as a collective society and individual have actually defined it. It doesn't, it takes away so much of the power that oh. it, Experienced. I'm so glad you said that because I really believe that. And I feel like if we're going off a strict DSM diagnosis mm. of criteria, we are missing the majority of what people are human experiencing. Totally. Okay. And who am I to say a criteria defines an experience? A hundred percent. And, and, I'll tell you this, I suffered a lot just because of this one thing, you know, coming from the childhood I had, and I had obviously a lot of embodied trauma, and I would engage in therapists and support and try to get help. And there was uh, an over a uh, span of time, we've become much more knowledgeable. It's just the way that it is. But of course. There, was, there was a lack of, of knowledge as far as trauma-informed therapy, coaching, sure. And, you know, we were clinking around in the dark, you know, hit, we, it was, it was messy, but that's the way that it, it, it is. That's yeah. just what it is. Um, and now mm -hmm. the understanding for myself, which is why I say nobody knows my experience better than me. Nobody knows me better than me. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's extremely important in this case when it's trauma and it's you and the experiencer, if it's small, because somebody, maybe somebody yelled at you while you were mm -hmm. driving, right? It's that moment that it just, boom, it just, it's like a lightning bolt sometimes. And then you right. just go about your day. If you were to sit at the end of the night from even that small trauma and breathe into that and bring that mindfulness, you know, bring yeah. your awareness <laughs> that you will feel and experience what that somaticized trauma is in your body. It's a conversation that's happening and yep. it's in, it's easily cleared uh, in different ways, yeah. but you need to, to, to recognize that that's trauma all the way to, you know, rape. Yeah. That's also trauma. Yeah. So that I, I do a lot of work, uh, shame-based work and a lot of, um, mm a lot of somatic healing, healing conversation, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of somatic. So how did you, for, for your journey to catch you a little bit more up to where you are now, mm -hmm. how did you navigate your way out of that trauma? And how did you find the tools and modalities to heal to the extent that we ever can fully heal, right? I mean, it's right. part That's of the life experience, but... I know, I'll tell you in that, on that note, I know that I don't know everything and that yes, I am healed, but all that is healed is not all there is to heal. And so yeah. I will be healing. There is no finish line. And when I was younger, I thought there was a finish line to that. I thought that, so I started, um, after that experience, um, of dying, it started a spiritual journey. I w had already seen religion. I call it churchianity. Churchianity mm -hmm. was alive and well in my family and religion. I never felt, you know, connected to that. Right. So, um, that, uh, death experience, those death experiences sort of catapulted me into spirituality. And also I, uh, I'm a great, I'm, I'm greatly empathic mm -hmm. to the detriment I was. And also I had a rich, uh, spiritual life. So I channeled and I'm, I'm psychic still and mm -hmm. energy. I can feel and see energy, etc. So you're very uh, in tune and connected. I'm very in tune and very intuitive, very connected. Now the journey I found was, um, it was through that spirituality and all of my experience, but really, it was about how, 
when I embodied that. So I, there was a bit of spiritual bypassing that was happening mm -hmm. um, as I held the near-death experiences, or I say the death experiences because I yeah. was dead, and the um, trauma and how I was navigating and what modalities I was using. So for a while, it looked really super messy, and I was seeing every therapist I could possibly see, and nobody was helping. In fact, it was re-injuring and re-traumatizing because mm. they weren't trauma-informed, so I was always thinking I was doing something wrong. I needed to be doing what they were saying, but I wasn't able to do it, so I, I, I. Like, yeah. resistant trauma is like that. Yeah. So... I, that led me to plant medicine. I was 31 years old um, and I had my first plant medicine experience. So that was, um, I had, it, that was another catalyst moment. Let's just keep it there. Yeah. And it opened up wide uh, a place for me to actually claim ownership of my experience mm. and realize that I was living unembodied. I wasn't occupying my body. I had the first few chakras. I was occupying that space. It was right. never safe to come into my body ever, right. ever, ever. So it would make sense. So yeah. I continued on that journey for quite a while. Coincidentally, it led to um, me being very sick, chronically ill. I woke up paralyzed Wow. I it led to a bigger journey of, of reclamation and from that journey and then the reclamation, so I would say the modalities I used was plant-based medicines. Mm -hmm. It was mindfulness <clears throat> and awareness. And the biggest um, catalyst was when I met the therapist who would walk me home. Mm -hmm. And for nine, eight years, I um, brought my my experience to the most magnificent woman, Susan, mm -hmm. um, back home on Maui. I brought my myself to her and each time she, I, I actually created a term for our process and it's called friendly witnessing. Mm -hmm. And that's the potentiation. She saw who I was. Mm -hmm. I struggled to become who I am was. I struggled to embody. So our modalities were, were vast. And I yeah. can tell you, I've spent a lot of time and money actually um, actualizing yeah. And embodying. Well, it's so interesting. One of the things you said about that therapist, Susan, um, when I was in graduate school of all learning all the different theoretical orientations as a therapist, my most favorite one was human centered. Mm. And it was the whole idea of helping your client actualize their human potential. Thank you very much. Um, and that is the essence of, and what you said, that friendly witnessing, it's, and it's funny because I do so much of that in my work and there's so much mindfulness embedded in that practice and there's so much compassion and awareness and it's just holding the space and holding the container. Yeah. And I will often say to clients, I will hold the, possi I will hold the space for the possibility of you getting to wherever you need from you, you don't have to believe it yet, but I'm going to hold the space for you. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that someone's holding that container of possibility and, and seeing that potential helps you realize, well, if someone else sees it in me, it must really be there. I just have to get there myself. Yeah, that, that was part of the experience for sure. The other part that I think was really, um, really big was that she was reparenting me and I didn't know it. Um, it became very clear to me soon after, but what had happened was, <laughs> I love that sentence. What had happened was what was going on was she was relating to me, like you said, human centeredness. So she didn't put herself above me as a therapist. Um, and I had experienced that before she was right there with me. So she actually gave me true and authentic love. Mm -hmm. She was holding love for me. She was feeling love for me. She embraced me in love so that I knew what that actually looked like. So she and felt like that. 
That's right. And so then when I could see and then compare and then somehow bring together what that experience was like so that I could actually own it. That maturation, the emotional, emotional maturation was able to actually finally have a place and yeah. take place and there was space for it. So that was extremely healing. That, uh, let, that led to a lot of embracing my own identity as a mm. human being and also the experiences that I had so that I could own them and be accountable and responsible so that I could um, love myself first and know what that meant so that yes. I could actually see that outside of myself and then manifest that back or attract that back. I know what that – I just – got the bigger understanding. So she reparented me. She really, she loved me. Yeah. And I recognized that right away. And grace, grace was the most, um, that was one of the most biggest blessings mm. in that healing that I did with her. She's a friend now. She's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. She is, she had always told me, uh, that I was extremely intelligent and very awake and very, and I always had thought that because I wasn't, the people around me were telling me that I wasn't and that, you know, that, that low right. vibrational mm. dysfunction, right? Um, I, but I knew inside that I was. I knew my experience because I had had that experience uh, of death. So I yeah. knew what I really truly was. And I know what we all are, right? And we all are love. And I was so uh, grateful. And to this day, I love her immensely immensely yeah talk about a life-changing person hundred percent yeah she's that she's the mother figure for yeah. me that's that tangible mother figure that I never and I'm gonna with. challenge you on one thing because she said she is the reason I'm doing the work I'm oh. doing today and I'll just challenge you lovingly and say no you're the reason you're doing the work you're doing today she just reminded you it's possible and that is in you. Yeah, you know what, Jory, that that is exactly right. She um I would say she planted the seed, right? Yeah, she said, yeah. and now go. I was I was um I was a midwife at the time that I was doing all of this stuff. So she just saw more potential than I knew was in me. Mm -hmm. She planted a seed and I you you're darn right, I grew that. I've definitely so grown. So tell me a little bit more about each of the books. So, all right, um, my launch for the audiobook tomorrow is for Love Letters to a Stripper. That book is, um, so in part of my journey, I was a sex worker. I uh, didn't have resources as a young person. And at 21 years old and being homeless, chronically homeless in mm -hmm. and in, on and off, um, I had the opportunity and, and the choice. And it was unconscious and it was also conscious. It was empowering. It was also not empowering uh, to turn to sex work in order to get um, a house and mm -hmm. money, right? So eight years forward to that, it came time for me to sort of embrace that, the, that experience. So this book is the book that I really wish I had had mm. as a sex worker. So it addresses mind, body, spirit in mm. um, living a more wealthy, aligned, and powerful life. Mm -hmm. Whether you stay in sex work or you have been, or you're under a trauma spell, that's mm -hmm. what I, my experience was that I was under a trauma spell mm -hmm. and that I was making decisions based on that trauma spell mm -hmm. and that led me into a lot of different places. This yeah. book addresses that and I'm just, it's a tap and an invitation to sex workers mm -hmm. um, to create that um, awareness. Wow. And then embrace wherever they are on that journey. So this is a best-selling book. I'm really excited and I really love it. It's, a, it's literally a love letter to a stripper, which translates to sex work. Yeah. And, and I, work, I work with them as well as mm -hmm. a huge, a bigger body of, I work with a lot of different people, but yeah. this was a big deal. This, well, then you must be a huge inspiration as well as someone who relates very deeply yeah. to likely what a lot of those women are experiencing that maybe has gotten them to where they are in their choices. And you're also holding that space possible for them as well. Yeah. So 
to, to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, there's a load of toxic shame that, that, and stigma that comes with being a sex worker. And from, uh, I'll say in my experience and in a lot of the clients that I work with in their experience as well, it is societal. They also have their own internalized shame. So they sort of grab each other and hold on to each other, this, this societal toxic, and it makes this, this toxic shame, which creates a lot of hiding and then isolation. And uh, the trauma spell is so deep that they're actually doing the work and sometimes it's glamorized and they believe at, that it's empowering. <clears throat> there are women who are empowered. I'm not saying that. It's important for me to make sure that that's clear. I am definitely mm -hmm. not saying, I don't want to generalize mm -hmm. at all. Everybody's different. But there is, in my clients, in their experiences, this toxic shame that keeps them hiding mm -hmm. and not addressing what's actually um, keeping them from realizing their full potential. And actually, really, what it comes down to is making money. Sex work, people are in that in that industry to make money so that they can live a better life than what they knew before. And, um, and I sort of, I, I, I want to say I got lost on a little bit of a tangent, but Oh, it's the shame. That's a big deal. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that it's, it translates into that hiding. Yeah. And I think it's important, which is what shame does. I yes. mean, you know, I'm, I'm reading another Brene Brown book right now on the dare to lead. Have you read yeah, that one? I love oh, it. Yes. Amazing. I've got all of her. Yes. Of, of course. Awesome. Right. But all of them. Yeah. And you know, but that shame keeps us hidden. It totally does. It did for me. It was a, it, the reason why I recognize it and <clears throat> wrote about it in this book. And it is the invitation to that conversation for, you know, my lovely sex workers to have with themselves is it kept me away from my potential, away yeah. from manifesting what I really wanted, you know, away from achieving goals that I set out for myself. Yeah. So I needed to actually address that before I could Move. And what a gift you're offering. Yeah. I, 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 you know, you said you must be inspiring. I, that's what I, I do every, I aspire to inspire. From. Oh my gosh. Yeah. My I, daughter has that written on her bedroom wall. I love, oh, there you go. Here's Aspi another. Aspire to inspire is written on my daughter's dry erase board in her room. I, I really love that. I really, that I embody. So I really do aspire to inspire going from wanting to die and having no will to live mm -hmm. to having the will, the wise will to continue. My purpose mm -hmm. is honestly to aspire, to continue to aspire and inspire Absolutely. from the place of my own deep wisdom. And so it would have been a gift if I would have had it. And that's why I wrote this book. I, 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 I'm so proud of you. And what, uh, um, it also seems to give, I, it sounds cheesy when I say this, but it gives purpose to your pain. Yes. Yeah. So I apologize if, it, if it, that brings it down to a convenient little nugget, but it feels very um, purposeful, you know, that you didn't die. You weren't meant to die. That was the vehicle, really. To so everyone I meet, uh, you know, I I'm alive because of them and people that I haven't met yet, right? The people that I'm going to be that I will be involved in their life, and I maybe right. move one way or the other. It's the same for me when people come in my path, like you and I. Universal synchronicities. Right. I know to pay attention. So do you. We are aware of other forces that are are just reality right and so they bring us together i know that i am that for people that i haven't yet met so mm -hmm. until i am actually not in this body that is what i am here to do hold love and well their potential and because you've written these books even when you are no longer here in this body you will continue to uh -huh. inspire so that is another reason why i did this i have a daughter and that legacy uh, I want to leave for her so she can aspire to inspire her, whether it's herself and whatever that looks like in her journey, her soul's journey yeah. and purpose 
And it was really like at the bottom line, the bottom line is I wanted to clear as much shit and as much um, like generational victimhood cycling as I possibly could to clear the way for her so that she, her name is Shamana. So it's shaman. Yeah. I want her to be able to realize what that means for her. I will have to send you. And for those of you listening, I apologize. I don't know how to get it to all of you. But for you, Angelina, because it's just like you and I have this conversation. I have this um, screenshot of a Facebook post I saw a while back. And the image is kind of creepy at first when you see it. But it's like an old person uh -huh. that is being what looks like enveloped and embraced by um, older women that are trees. Yeah. And the hands of the trees are kind of creepy. And it looks like it's enveloping and it looks haunted and it's kind of a spooky photo. But the caption has to do with breaking the transgenerational pain. Exactly and how the, what are the, one of the phrases, how it's like the toxic and um, the toxic course of the trunk of that tree will try to pull you back in. And those roots are so deep and they come and they take grab on you. And the black sheep is the one who says no more. The it's black sheep is the one who liberates the toxic course of that tree trunk. And I, that it, they'll be shunned from the family, they'll be ostracized, they'll be victimized, they'll be blamed, it'll all be externalized, but that is the liberating force for all the future branches. Yeah, that actually, that, so uh, that brings tears to my eyes and it moves me emotionally for a few reasons. One, um, having... My mother was the black sheep, although she was responsible for a great deal of my abuse. She too, of course, so often in generational victimhood or in generational like toxic cycles. Um, she was a black sheep. I was the black sheep. And we're, we're most, most of the time, we're the most emotionally um, authentic. And yes. that oh, sets, absolutely. Out of, yeah, it set, sets the catalyst for the family for their unknown. So I was the um, what is that called? The goat? The sheep goat? What is the word? Why can't the I? The scapegoat. Thank you. I really love that. I can't remember that because yeah. to be honest, most of my experience in this was I was a scapegoat for my family. Right. Yes. Here is this tree trunk and this whole. It, it definitely. Um, takes uh it, it's existential it's it, it, oh it, it is it is existential well, and you're you're deciding to no longer play the family game whatever yes. that game is and i have i just pulled up a quote i want to read you um it's by rd lang who i don't know who that is but i like the quote <laughs> and it says they are playing a game they are playing at not playing a game if i show them i see they are i shall break the rules and they will punish me I must play their game of not seeing I see the game. Say the last one sentence again. I must play their game of not seeing yes. that I see the game. Yes. yes. And I, I, I think of that along with that image that, of that post of, you know what? I can, once you see that it's a game, you can no longer play the game because now the authenticity is to, I know the game. I can't play the game anymore. Yeah. And I'm going to break free. Yeah, which is amazing. And, I, and I'm called to share this with you just because I feel um, sitting next to me on my desk as I just reached and grabbed for is a quote from Young Pueblo, the poet, and this yeah. beautiful poetry book uh, titled Inward. Mm -hmm. And the quote that I have sitting here says, her rebirth was stunning. She lifted herself up from the depths of despair, grasped her dreams, embedded them in her heart and walked forward into a future that only her will and vision could control. So. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it right there. That's it right there. Exactly. That's, that's exactly it right there. It's, I, I have it sitting on my desk and it moves me every single time I read it because Walked forward into a future that only her will and vision could control. That's exactly it. That that quote 
obviously speaks exactly to what I've been expressing today and yeah. know to be to, in the core of my being is the exact experience. I, I can say that that, that is in words, right? Yeah. It's expressed in words. That's what, that's what it is for me. And your rebirth is stunning. And you, my love, are stunning. And you're generously loving. And I love that. Well, I'm authentically responding to your energy right now. And thank you. Yes. And your, um, your gift is huge. And I know that you see that now. But I, I really am excited to share your work and to help promote your work and give more opportunity for people to find you and your, what you're offering. Yeah, that's great. That sounds good. I actually, um, I want to thank you. Number one, thank you. And number two, I just wrote another book that it takes this love letters to a stripper uh, and broadens it a bit. And it's called the spiritual entrepreneur um, mm. quantum leap into your next level of impact and abundance. So it speaks exactly to that young Pueblo poem. Yeah. It's exactly that. Oh, I, I can't, I know I'm going to read it. Your son, I'm, I'm going to, yeah. I can't wait to read it. You're on my launch team. So you get, to have, you get to have the ARC, the advanced reader copy, and you get to give me your, your input. And I value that. And I'm honored that you accepted that. So yes. thank you for that. And also thank you for holding energy and spreading mm. my work and message. And likewise, of course, Jory, you know, I'm, I, I celebrate celebrate your successes. And I, I love seeing your life that you live authentically. You know, that's my highest value in it. I yeah. have to say it's that authenticity of living in the values in which I'm teaching and, and subscribing to. I had a young client I was seeing this afternoon and she's 17 mm -hmm. and she follows me on Instagram and she even was like, you know, I can just tell in who you are, you're authentic outside of this office. That's it. And I'm not just, and, and you know, you're doing the same thing. You, you, you got to practice what you preach to That's have right. this rebirth be stunning. If it's not from that place of authenticity, it's, it's a farce. A hundred percent agree. And in this day and age, and I'm, I'm not really trying to like get into a lower vibration, but being online is sort of an interesting um, dynamic. And, is. and being authentic. So my work hasn't translated 100% yet online, as you would say. It's in per person or analog, as yeah. ours would call this. And so bringing that online, I'm sure, um, I think people can feel that authenticity and that transparency. And that actually will give the results. So that friendly witnessing I was talking about, yes. that is something that every single one of us knows what that looks like on the outside. So genuinely connecting with a person, holding that space and having that be congruent like mm -hmm. from social media to being in person and analog to what you put out because you're aligned in an integrity with your values yes. is key. And it's key to results. Whatever the results are that she's looking for, she sees you're holding that potential <clears throat> yes. and the relationship is, you know, confirmed. Well, and to sum it all up, because we're almost out of time, but I think the goal behind all of this is everyone just wants to be seen, heard, and validated. Thank you. No exceptions. That is it. I agree. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Actually, that quote is on my wall in my bedroom. I have see, I see it for probably about six or seven years now yes. on a continuous basis every day. We all just want to be seen and heard. No exceptions. I'm there are no exceptions. Yes. Uh, well, I feel like I truly could talk to you for hours. I, I agree. Really yeah. But thank you so much. Everyone who is listening can will be able to get any links to your books or um, how to contact you. So that will all be in the show notes. And Angelina, my dear, thank you so much for so authentically showing up as your full, beautiful self. And Thank I know I get to see you in a couple of weeks, so I'm super excited for that. And I'm excited to be on your launch team of your next book. And um, I'm just, I'm so happy that our souls and paths have connected and aligned. So thank you so and much. Say, I want to thank you for being a safe place. Oh, I thank you. That's really such a gift it. to hear. 
Yeah, of course. I recognize that. I have that safe space in me. I recognize it in you. And thank you so much for pulling it forward in our space, in this container that we created for this talk, for whoever this is actually going to move or help. And at the very least, it moved you and I. So that's all. Amen, that. baby. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, uh, thank you again. And I really can't wait to see you. Thank you. Me as well. Ditto. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com.